this episode of The Silburn Show, the Solution-Oriented Summit, creating a platform for effective discourse, seeking solutions and impacting actions, tackling knife and gun crime in our community. Let it not be our legacy. started 25 years ago, um, the kind of people I represented were adults charged with anything from uh, minor petty crime to fraud. But certainly in the last six years, or maybe the last 10 years, I have represented a different type of client. And it has made me extremely sad to see the ages are getting younger and younger. <laughs> I have represented, most recently, uh, someone charged with murder, aged just 14. The youngest person I've represented charged with murder is aged 12. And at one point in my career, I was ready to give up because it broke my heart. Uh, after carrying out my professional obligations of representing these young people, I had to every day look in the eyes of young boys and crime doesn't know colour but you know I have to call it as I see it in my experience and in all the murder cases that I have conducted over the last 15 years because you only get to do those sort of cases when you become more senior so over the last 15 years every single one of them has been black and I have to call it as I see it and it hits home for me because when I look in the eyes of those young boys who I'm tasked to represent, I see my son. I see my sons. I have two sons. One of them is 15, the other one's 13. And so I feel it more than perhaps a lot of my contemporaries who are generally white, well to do, have been to very good universities, and they're in very elitist, noble profession. They're very good lawyers, but I have a, an edge in the sense that I feel it more because the young man that I'm representing looks like my child. He could be me when I was growing up in the streets of Thornton Heath. So I have, I can claim some form of empathy and understanding because they look like me. They look like my child. And what the public don't see because of course you have the right to go to the public gallery and watch a murder trial, but I get to see behind the scenes, as I have done for many years. So that's uh, in the cells down in the courtroom. That's at Felton Young Offenders Institution, and for anyone who's ever been there, it's one of the saddest places that I've had to visit uh, in many years. To see young men caged up by animals, shouting, screaming, waiting for their social visits, queues of parents waiting outside to see their loved ones. It's heartbreaking. And I get an easy ride in because I go through the site for legal visits. But I can't imagine the trauma of mothers, sisters, fathers, brothers, having to queue up to go and see their loved one who's on remand or serving a sent sentence. I get to see these kids downstairs after 12 people who don't even know them from Adam have sat in judgment on their case and delivered a verdict of guilty to murder and they haven't even reached 15. I get to go down to see them in the cells when the reality of what they have been involved in this trial process has come to an end and they are looking at a mandatory life sentence. I get to see it. And everything that we've talked about this afternoon, I can perhaps summarize in the most recent case that I've just finished. I won't go into the details of the names because they're still yet to be sentenced, but for the last six weeks, I've been involved in a case in an affluent part of the country 
where five young boys were charged with murder, all aged 14 at the time, 15 at the age of trial. On Monday, the verdict after a six week case where the issues were very complex, where each of them was blaming one or the other, it required thought to present the case in respect of each of them. It required thought, I believed, by a jury of 12 to see if they could work out what had happened, bearing in mind the ages of the young men who were being tried and the implications that would follow thereafter. Four hours. Four hours. Can I tell you that the lawyer I was working with, it got to about three o'clock, and he said, Stephen, it's a lovely sunny afternoon. You go home and pick up your sons and be with your family. See you tomorrow. I hardly got back into London when my phone rang. Guilty. All of them. What? My response, you're having a laugh, this is a joke. No, guilty, all of them. Less than four hours. That's the fastest verdict, conviction for murder I have ever been involved in. I've been in cases with less serious than that, when the jury had been out for a week on one person. And my heart sank. I sank for two reasons. One, because I wasn't there when the verdict came in, and two, because those five young men were all now looking at a life sentence for murder. And I'm told that when the verdict came in, there was no emotion at all on any of the jurors' faces. Not one. Usually, in cases I've done, at the Old Bailey, number one court, number four court, doesn't matter which, you can see the emotion on the faces of the jury, wrapped with pain as they've had to work out who's responsible for the death of another and to sit in judgment of a child. I was also involved in the murder of a rapper called M-Dot. Some of your children may know him. I represented the person who stabbed him. I couldn't believe it, but apparently two of the defendants who sat in the dock and the verdict came back started screaming and yelling for their mums. And that emphasizes that these are children. These are children appearing in an adult court. We're not talking of going down to the magistrate's court and getting a slap on the wrist. When you're charged with murder and you're appearing at the Old Bailey, and Leroy will tell you the most famous court perhaps in the world, young children are appearing in the dock in number one court at the Old Bailey. It's actually scary. If it's you're frightening. Even though the police officer going to court one, and you're supposed to be if, prosecuting. This, you it's think, scary. this is the same courtroom where the judge sat put the black cap on his head and told Ruth Ellis, you're going to hang by the neck until you're dead. Our children are appearing there on trial for murder. And the other thing is, this particular part of the country where I appeared, an all-white jury. Now the reason why I make that point is you don't get to pick the jury who try you. You can only object if there is a reason, or a valid reason, i.e. that you know the person. But when they are called and sworn to take the oath, to give true verdicts according to the evidence, you can't just object because you don't like the look of someone. So when this jury is shuffled in, all 12 white jury in a very conservative part of town, no doubt daily mail readers, reading about gang crime in inner London, kids running amok with zombie knives and all sorts, references to gangs, 
All of that came out of the trial. And they sat there for six weeks, stony-faced, listening to the evidence, listening to the eloquent submissions by all the barristers in court. And when it came to their moment to be involved, directly involved, they said, yeah, we'll show you boys. Guilty. Every single one of you. The young man who died was also 15. He died from one stab wound to the femoral artery and he bled out. There were potentially two knives involved, eight stab wounds, and after we heard the evidence from the pathologist, it was clear that only two people could have stabbed him. All of them convicted. Why were they all convicted? We come to joint enterprise. Because the jury knew that there were only two people who could have inflicted the wounds, and one who inflicted the fatal wounds. But the process of the deceased when he received that fatal wound. But through encouragement on social media, and being shown to be part of a gang, and inciting it, you can be charged with murder. You can be charged with manslaughter. I've got another case, similar. Five boys. One guy caught on CCTV, I've seen it, he stabs the guy to death, he drops down dead. All the others who are there looking round, then run away, but you're all charged with manslaughter. He pleaded guilty to murder last two weeks ago. The others are awaiting trial. So this is what we're dealing with. Our young people not perhaps realizing the implications of what they are involved in. Because I guarantee you that with all the bravado on the streets and the gangs and all the rest of it, when you're downstairs in the cell looking at life, and I can testify to this, they're like little babies crying for their mums. James Oyabuna was the former British heavyweight champion, and I was in that murder case. And a young man called Mulenga was the person who shot him in the Chateau Six nightclub in Fulham. They went to the nightclub, a group of them, to have some fun, but unknown to some of them, Mulenga was carrying a firearm. How he managed to get through security, I don't know. But James, James Oyabona, who was working as security, as door security that day, decided he was going to challenge them the smoking in the nightclub. You can Google all of this. He, he challenged them. Mulenga pulled out a gun and shot him in the neck. That trial was at the Old Bailey. Unfortunately, my client was acquitted of murder. But I remember going downstairs after Mulenga was convicted of murder and hearing the most almighty scream as the judge had just passed the sentence of life with a minimum term of 26 years. He was 21. I often, when I go to schools to talk about knife crime, say, just to put this in perspective, for those people who don't comprehend, anyone celebrating a birthday, think about your next 26 birthdays. Anyone thinking about celebrating Christmas as it approaches, can you envisage the next 26 Christmases? Mm. That's how long it is. It's not 26 and do half. Mm. No, 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 no. It's life. As we read in the paper, well, people don't get life. Mm. Well, there are very few people who get the full life term. There's only a, maybe 20 or 30 people, I think, in the country who are serving a full life term prison sentence. But life with a minimum term means you do the tariff, which is 26 plus, as an adult, less for children. Children can get as much as 12. 12 years. That's, you've got to do 12 years. And then the parole board will decide whether you are eligible for release. That's what they don't tell them out there when you're running with the man them on the road. They don't tell them that. So, I 
feeling for all those reasons. And in this case, the other thing I picked up on was and the silver was criticized. How can you have a summit and it's all men? Well, I'm regularly in court and I don't see any men. The public gallery, as it was in this case, packed full of women. And one father turned up, I think, in the whole six weeks sporadically. It was just the mothers. So, here are the men who want to try and get to the nub of the issue. So that's the first thing. Second thing these boys all had in common. They were all excluded from mainstream school. They were all in referral units. Bar one. My client wasn't, but he had been suspended um, a number of times from school. But four of them, all at referral unit. What else did they all have in common? They smoke a bit of weed. It's about cannabis. The boy who died was a self-confessed cannabis dealer. And through social media, he called it on. Anyone who wants to come and sell in my patch, step to me. The prosecution theory is that this group went down there to teach him a lesson. He ends up dead. This is a guy who, just a few hours before, had gone out with his family to get bread to make sandwiches to feed to the homeless in the church. So his mother didn't even know what he was into. So there's a lesson to all of us. Get in your children's business and know what they're up, what they're up to. Because he was leading a double life. He now ends up dead. So cannabis is a factor. Exclusion from school, factor. Absent father, factor. And for me, because I'm in it, and I see it, and I made many, many mitigation speeches for people who are about to be sentenced, and I'm very passionate about it, because I feel it, as I said to you when I started, unlike a lot of my contemporaries who stick to the script. And I remember saying to the judge at the Old Bailey, when Fowles Richards was being sentenced for M. Duck's murder, and he got 14 years. I said, where are the men? Look, my lord. Look to the public gallery. Show me the men. Where's his father? And all the lawyers were looking at me like, wow. But I had to say it. I had to say it. And the judge said to me, he commended me, he said, Mr. Atkinsania, I can't say it from my position in my position as a judge. I'm glad you said it. And we have to call it as it is. It's not an easy fix. There are so many issues. There are so many, so many issues. Silver and I have talked regularly. Social, economic factors, education, yes. parenting. But from where I sit, and I can only give this perspective from where I sit, I'm at the end of it. I'm in the bowels of the court when they're crying wanting their mum, saying I didn't do it. And once you're sucked into that system, you can't get out. You can appeal. Guess what? The court that goes above the Crown Court, the Court of Appeal, is even rougher. Three of them, intellectual heavyweights, will use intellectual manoeuvres to ensure that the conviction is upheld. You ain't going anywhere. And my view is, why put yourself at the mercy of the court system? Because the court system follows order and principle. Yes. Doesn't do emotion. Yes. The jury are told, whatever emotions you may feel in this case, push them aside. So you subject yourself to that. Twelve people who don't even know you are going to determine your destiny. Why would you do that? Touching on gangs, what Leroy said. In this case, police submitted a whole wealth of material. We spent two days of the case just arguing what we call bad character evidence. Mm. And the bad character evidence all related to 
the matrix, the gang matrix, because they said members of the AP gang and the EN3 gang, and you're all involved, and this is a gang-related thing. And they went on social media and showed pictures of the boys doing all these signs, one of them with, 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 with a, uh, um, putting a gun like this, another one with a, uh, a cutlass that he'd found posing with a, a machete. All of that was evidence that the Crown wanted to rely on to say these are gang members, members of the jury. In the end, we had to have a compromise, but the evidence went in. So guess what, in the jury's mind, these were all little mini gangsters. Yeah. But we spent three days arguing that. And the police came up with all this intelligence of this one seen with that one associating with this one. Uh, um, this one um, was next to someone else when he committed a crime or he hangs about in this area and he's associated with known gang members. Say, so I can't do it anymore. Because it hurts. I regularly cried in cases with defendants. I've taken defendants under my wing because I'm not just a barrister, I'm almost like a, 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 an agony uncle, a, a, a psychologist. <coughs> because I've spent time with these young people. Mm. And look, even before we get into the nitty gritty of the law, I look at them. I say, the first thing I say to them, if you understand something, what's that? You could be my son. Why are you here? And I try and take some of them with me. Through mentorship. In last November, I'm doing my invite for my 50th birthday. And let me reach out to him. At my birthday, he walks in. Now a 35 year old man. At my 50th, with his girlfriend. Now a company secretary. Having bought his first house in Lewisham. And I'm thinking to myself, there is the impact of what we can do in our communities as individuals. And I, you know, I don't just see my job as just doing a job. Yes, I'm a capable advocate, I like to think, and I, what I've done for you know, 25 years, I've given the law 30 years of my life. And at the point when I'm ready maybe to walk away because it hurt too much to see young black kids being sent down for life sentences, I thought, no, I need to still be in this. But more importantly, I need to reach even further out Archer, with white kids dying, it would be sorted. Sorted. But because it's not, and it's happening amongst our community, well, we'll have a few meetings, we'll get the mayor involved, we'll try and come up with a strategic plan, but the killing still continues. I'm also amazed after a, a strategic meeting or plan, the next morning I switch on the news, there's been another murder. <laughs> so, we need to own it, and we need to be brave enough to own it, not to say because, you know, you've got a former met. Uh, commissioner, or, or, or you've got a baron. No, we are all living in communities where we can affect what's going on. Be my brother's keeper and all the rest of it. Know what's happening to the children. Challenge. But for me, there are a number of things which I just want to share with you before I finish. Education is key. And I used to look at him. He said, education is key because whatever you want to do, it gives you options. Yes. And I tell the youngsters, have the piece of paper. Because if you have the piece of paper, you've got options. Yes. If you don't have the piece of paper, you're already on the back foot. Because guess what? We are already on the back foot. Even me, when I used to go to court to start with, with my suit and my bag and my wig and my gown, the staff would say, which trial are you appearing in front of? as a defendant. And I used to be very angry when I was young. How dare they ask me, am I a defendant? Dressed like this, speaking as I do, going into a courtroom, and you're asking me, am I a defendant? But then I figured, well, I can't win, because if I dress nicely, I'm a fraudster. But if, or, or, or I'm the other. So let me not even worry about that. But I know that if anyone challenged me, I've got the paper. I went to law school, I've got my degree, I did my pupillage, you can't take it away from me. And my dad always used to say, they can take anything away from you, but they can't take your education, they can't take your paper. So, education, it starts with education, 
school intervention, we need to get into the schools. Yes. When the headmistress asked me to come and speak, she said, are they too young? I said, hell no. I need to come in and speak to these youngsters because they're going to be influenced by siblings and people around them. environment. They need to know what's going on. And it was wonderful to address those children. And they were more glued up than we could imagine. I'm afraid to say I think we need some parenting classes. Yes. Let me tell you something. Yes. I'm 51 in November this year, and my son is only 15 now. I go to court and I'm representing 15 year olds, and their mothers could be my children. I'm thinking, well, it might not mathematically be true, but they are very, very young. Babies raising babies. Now, I'm not criticizing anyone for having children very young, but it's a fact that if you have not had the skills to parent a child, when a boy gets to 15 and his dad's not around and you yourself are not mature enough to do it, what's going to happen? So we need parenting classes for the vulnerable parents. I'm not saying hopeless parents, but vulnerable, who need assistance. And that should, in my view, come through our local councils setting up programs in our boroughs, in our neighbourhoods, for the people who are vulnerable, because the school can identify who they are, because they often may, the children are not always organised, we can organise, we can work out very quickly with those who need help. We need, and alongside that, I grew up in Thornton Heath when we had community centres, part of small community centre, God bless it, I remember it. It's still there, that's where I went, part small. Used to go there, table tennis, with my friends and talk to people, meet the other people, young people, but we need to obviously bring it forward to the 21st century and have modern workshops, community workshops, where youth programs are there, educating our next generation about what is important about getting that next piece of paper to get them where they need to be. Because what they don't know is that when you're peddling the drugs and messing around with the cannabis deals and making your £10 there and your £100 there and selling rock, there is a price to be paid, and it's often with your life, or time in jail. And those gang members who have got your back on the street, as soon as you go down that cell, you're on your own. They move on to the next victim. So, in my view, we need um, workshops and programs for the young. And I think there also needs to be a review of this school policy on exclusion and referral units. Because too many young black boys are being labelled as Disrupted, right? And I'd say it from personal experience, because at Downsy Primary School, where I went when I started, the head teacher, and I've still got the report, Stephen's disruptive. But thank God for a Nigerian dad. <laughs> eh? Disruptive? <laughs> Never. He went and he fixed it. I'm serious. Disruptive? Because it's a label. Disruptive. Just as Stephen's got a chip on his shoulder. That was the other one back in the day. Chip on the shoulder, disruptive, excluded, and then the spiral starts. So we need to review, in my view, the school exclusions. And, I, and that's one reason why I volunteered to sit on the independent review panels for exclusion. And I've got one coming up on Thursday. Because I figured if I'm not in it to see what's going on, then we don't know what's going on. All we do is we get the letter. He's out. He's been excluded. Challenge it if you, if you like. So those are just some of the things that I think we need to do. There are some very dangerous people out there, and so I think there is room for tougher sentencing, only in the sense that sometimes we, we need to make sure that when people are being punished, they're being punished properly. Because there are some, some people who need to be punished. But when you are dealing with very young people, we have to take our time to see what the solution is. Proper solution, long term solution. Not just write people off and say, that's your last life sentence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on the Silver and Show. And uh, of course, what I'd like you to do is to like the videos share the videos and subscribe to the channel let people know about it but important thing is also to comment let us get your comment let's get your views so we can understand how to even please you better ladies and gentlemen so as i said share like subscribe ah thank you i saw you there 
you subscribed and you shared. Thank you so much. See you next time.